take it one day at a time. Tell me in a sentence who you are. Brian, here's the other thing. You you made a request to be traded. We were all waiting still to hear from Kawhi. Someday maybe we'll understand. My guess is we'll never understand it completely. We'll never understand it completely. We'll never understand it completely. When people are brave enough to escape from the grasps of a cult, there's usually a period of fear. Fear that the entity from their past will find them and hurt them, legally, physically, even socially making you look like the unstable one. Some cults go as far as disassociating you from the rest of your own family, essentially making you an outcast, alone, as they continue to bury you and discredit you. It takes enough out of you just to get out, and then you have to deal with life after, with only the false tools and beliefs you've gained from the cult. But whatever circumstances you have to deal with, one thing is completely clear, you don't ever go back. Your daily goal is to get as far away physically and mentally as you can. So now let's go to the relative present day and proceed backwards. Team USA minicamp is around the corner and the speculation on whether Kawhi Leonard will participate or not is dialed all the way up. And while Camp Kawhi is signaling he won't, and Kawhi Leonard will not report to USA Basketball Camp, sources told our Chris Haynes, the talking faces on TV seem to feel a certain way. If you're ready to go and you're feeling good and you want to put to rest all these ideas that maybe you're not healthy enough, that maybe you're not going to be the same top five player that we got used to seeing the two-time defensive player of the year, why not show up to camp? Now to his credit, Kawhi has never really participated with Team USA, and I'm not sure why this would be any different, but whatever the past reasons, now there is a bright blaring reason why he wouldn't want to go. And that's because this man is at the helm. You know, Mr. Colangelo and Sean Ford thought it was important to bring in a, a new crew of young guys so that they get indoctrinated into knowing what this is all about. And to me, this is plenty reason for Kawhi, specifically Kawhi, to not participate. He just escaped. <laughs> Side note, I always wonder why Team USA and the powers that control that would replace this phony with this old man. I mean, he's got the reins for the next 20 years or whatever it is. He's gonna be like 100 by then. But I think it's a combo. It's the military background, you know, representing your country. It's probably really tickles his fancy. But also, it's that cold heart that really doesn't care who the players are and thinks humans are all interchangeable. This is a benefit to coaching this type of team. But what did he escape from? Let's go to the real beginning. With the first pick in the 1997 NBA draft, the San Antonio Spurs select Tim Duncan from Wake Forest University. Sure, this isn't the literal beginning, but theoretically it is. When Tim Duncan joined the Spurs, it allowed Greg Popovich to take his final ultimate form, the one that the legends and myths would be built on. Now, yes, winning is a huge key in all this, and you can't fake winning. Winning really did take skill and superior strategy. Having two of the greatest big men in history on your squad sure helped. <laughs> but there was something darker at the heart of this team, at the core of the Popovich system. Because, you know, Colt may be a good broad way of describing Pop and his system, but I think there's a lesser, more specific, fitting comparison. And that is dominant. But not this kind, not in the Shaq type of dominant. We're talking about this kind, like in Dominatrix. You know, the stuff the Fifty Shades of Grey books and movies are all about. Side note, yes, I've seen one of them. It came on HBO randomly one night and we watched it, deal with that. So anyway, the movie, while I watched this man, Christian Grey, tie up and spank an eager amateur woman, all I could think about was Greg Popovich. Yep, deal with that one too. And the reason was that this control this guy had over this woman is far beyond the physical bondage. He has control over her mind and perception. And if you actually watch one of these movies, you'll see that it's not just her. He's got a whole clan of these desperate submissive women who are begging to be controlled and abused by him. And it really rang true that yes, this is it. This is the Popovich game plan, his whole system, his entire approach. So let me explain or let 
these guys explain. We do not have on our uh, hands a potentially violent person or a rebel at all. We have then a person that is looking for boundaries. He then is looking for someone to tell him what to do. He is looking for someone to tell him what to do. To tell him what to do. So, to see if it's true, let's examine the framework. Let's examine the players. More than any team, the Spurs love bringing in unknown foreigners, the ones who barely speak the language or are relatively unfamiliar with the ways of the league. Pop has made it clear that he prefers the young international players over those from the United States, to the point where half of his team was foreign born. But though this may not be incriminating on its own, it is a fact that these players are more dependent and grateful to be in this position than someone who knows they could play for any team. And along those lines, the other source for the Spurs talent is the D League, or G League, the XYZ League. Prime example, Danny Green. And those players, much like the foreign born players, are saturated in humility and simply grateful for the chance. Popovich upset at Danny Green. These players will also do whatever the heck they are told. And then we have the outright deviants, the nut jobs, the ones who may participate in weird shit in their own lives, on their own time. This world of control and submissiveness is a game to them, and that's how folks like Dennis Rodman and Steven Jackson and even the hack jobs like Bruce Bowen thrive in the system. And the final group, the old and desperate. And these are the players who are either ring chasing or reaching for a respectable place to play for their final years. These players are the ones running on fumes and thankful and grateful to just be on a good team with a chance to win. They are desperate. And desperation is a hell of a drug because you can be convinced to do anything. What's common between all these groups is they are in a mental space to do whatever they're told. You've got to accept coaching. It's not criticism, right. it's coaching. They're more humility than hubris, more gratefulness to just be here than confidence they could play anywhere. This alone shows how Pop and crew build their cult of control. So okay, once you have your followers, the perfect group to exploit and brainwash, you still have to exercise your power. And Pop does this many ways. And it's not just on the players, by the way. Pop tries to control every scenario he ever encounters. The players, the press, the fans, the whole damn league. And the way it starts is by blatant acts of disrespect. But let's start with how it's exhibited through the players. Let's start light. Let's look at Pau Gasol. Yeah, I only bring him up because I for real forgot he was even in the league. And that's a direct result of how the Spurs use and are slowly burying him. Alive. The chances of Pau Gasol, for any reason, breaking through with a great or outstanding performance are nearly zero. Because that's not what the Spurs want from him. They just have him and use him like a slightly shinier, less durable Tiago Splitter. Or Aaron Baines. I know he's old, but he's also at his all-time least minutes and least points, and sometimes he doesn't even start. I mean, seeing him on the Spurs makes you forget what kind of dominant scoring force he was in a previous life. But again, the Spurs just want you to submit to the system. This is also what Pop tried to do to David West. But David West never quite fell for it. He bailed after a year because he's a player that had too much pride to submit. But when Pop had Tracy McGrady on the team, clearly past his prime, he also effectively killed any chance of a Twilight career because he never played him. Pop never gave Tracy a chance to redeem himself or shine for a moment in his final years. Listen, I know T-Mac was in his twilight, but I'm sure a ton of folks didn't even know he was ever on the Spurs. I mean, he was even there for the finals against the Heat. Why? I mean, we know that Shaq went to Boston. Infamously, we know that Barkley went to the Rockets. But there's a whole cast of players that spent time with the Spurs, but we just don't know much about it. See, at that point in T-Mac's career, being submissive and just doing whatever he was told was probably something he wanted. But most importantly, Tim Duncan was still there, making sure that people on the ground fell in line. See, Greg Popovich buries players and still expects them to go out in public and praise him. And boy, do they praise him. If it were you and you were, it was your decision or you were advising LeBron, what do you think he should do? Go to San Antonio. You do? I do. I think him being coached finally by an elite coach and pop. This is just his power play. He even like to test the waters of power with Tim, sitting him at odd times. And even in the situation like game six versus the Heat, that monumental shot by Ray Allen where the Spurs couldn't secure a defensive rebound. For some unexplained reason, 
Pop took Tim out, and I always believed that was a simple moment where Pop wanted to remind the world who was in control. And the players are nobody, and he is the system. That may seem reckless, but reckless was his MO. This isn't a conspiracy. He really believed he was so damn smart, smarter than everybody's instinct, and thought Boris Diaw. Chunkster Boris Diaw would be better in these final few moments. He tried to one-up everybody, instead of just doing the clear and obvious move. It's like when the Seahawks threw in the Super Bowl instead of running, like everyone thought they should. These are those moments when your hubris and self-assuredness and buying into your own greatness makes you think you have the answer, even when there's no question. He inserted himself into a situation where he was not required. Sometimes you are so brilliant, which Greg Popovich is. You are so brilliant as a head coach you can. that you can make questionable decisions because you're constantly thinking. You overthink sometimes the Sometimes you got to let it ride, man. Yep, that's exactly what I just said. So then what about the players that don't fit? Again, players like David West with too much self-worth and personal pride. Well, we watch Pop disassociate them as fast as humanly possible. Remember Jason Simmons? He was an accident. A young guy who started to show flashes in garbage time. He was clearly a player with potential. He was a surprise player that any team would have been ecstatic to discover. But then why was it almost expected that Pop would dump him? I remember that. It was made clear he wasn't going to be a spur long term. And sure, they made some stuff up about the contract, but who the heck does that? Dump young potential talent? I mean, he even came out of the D League. Exactly how Pop likes him. And Pop had zero blowback, not any media criticism for bailing on him. Now, the real reason Simmons was excommunicated was that this kid did not fit the system. The system that requires players to be nothing, interchangeable and worthless outside of Pop. He just showed too much individuality. Too many of these. Clearly not a submissive type. So Pop had to let him go. Initially offering him a measly 1.6 million before rescinding the offer altogether. So now let's get deeper, uglier. Let's talk about Manu, poor Manu. A classic case of being born into captivity. Barely knew the language, conformed to a world that Pop built almost immediately. But Ginobili always pushed Pop with his style of play. He'd get flashy on the court and try to play hero ball. Throughout his career, he drives Greg Popovich crazy. He pissed Pop off numerous times. And Ginobili remembers one time in particular. I got an offensive rebound one minute to go up one, and I took it to the three-point line, and, uh, and I fake a shot. And I look at him, and I saw him jumping, I'm not LeBron James style. He, he, he jumped this high. <laughs> But he did fit the personality type, so what was Pop going to do? He exercised a serious power play, making Ginobili a sixth man in his prime, capping his career trajectory. For real, a man who propelled the Eurostep into new heights was a key part of four championships. Why did he only make the All-Star team twice, two times? I believe Pop did this on purpose. Cutting off people's potential, not allowing them to reach their ultimate heights is sadistic. It's sick, man, it's selfish. And he does that to this day. Then there's Tony. How does he fit? Well, Tony, he's one of the just natural deviants, right out of the gate. And not to make this about his personal life, but if you look into it, then you'll see what his natural behavior is. And you understand why he might be into a relationship like this with Pop. Again, Tony, a guy that in other circumstances would probably be discussed as an all-time great point guard. Maybe top 10. A four-time NBA champ. Starting point guard for the four-time NBA champ. A finals MVP. As for point guards, it basically goes Magic with five and then Tony with four. Also, back to that Ray Allen shot, if you look back at that game, if the Spurs win, we'd be talking about an all-time great finals performance. Tony Parker was balling in that game. And don't tell me they don't mean anything because it was Tim Duncan's team. No. Again, Tony was finals MVP one year. And regardless, when it's usually a guard-big man combo, both players usually get credit. I mean, damn, he was putting up 20 a game in those winning years. How is he essentially forgotten in the conversation? Why does he feel like an outsider when you talk about all-time greats? This is Pop's doing. He cut him off at every potential breakthrough. Listen, this is about dominance and submissiveness. Even LaMarcus Aldridge. You know, we thought he left Portland because he wanted to be the number one option. Remember, his quarrel was with a billboard, a commercial that only featured Damian Lillard. And he was not happy. He wanted to be featured too. You remember that drama? No? You don't? Why don't you? Because he's not a dominant personality. Do you even know what his voice sounds like? 
If I told you he had a European accent, would you believe me? See, he thought his issue was that he wanted to be number one. He felt his ego growing. But what we learned, what he learned, was that he just needed someone to tell him to shut the fuck up and get back in line. Apparently that's all he really needed. But in his case, it did take some extra manipulation to get LaMarcus to submit. As an outsider, he was not the typical Spurs archetype, so there had to be some breaking down. And that's what happened his first year. Pop tried to break him. Greg attempted to change everything about his game. And we did hear a bit about this stage. Marcus leaking or signaling that he wasn't happy. Uh, from what I'm told, this is an individual that is very, very unhappy in San Antonio right now. He feels that the Spurs have compromised him, his productivity. They have hurt his game. And as a result, he wants out, Max, and he wants out in the worst way. But this was just Pop's usual boot camp style, military approach. He has to break you first and then build you back up in his image. So he did that to LaMarcus, and then after year one, he started to allow LaMarcus to do what he did best. And now Pop has demonstrated the control he needs. And somewhere in the process, it stripped LA of his ego and ambitions to be a star. LA was now a spur. But this wasn't always the method because for nearly his entire career, he had a partner in this system, Timmy. Tim Duncan was clearly the key. He was the elder statesman. He was the guy that showed the new submissives how to behave. And because players respected him so much, their respect transferred over to Pop. Pop level of respect is so high. Even the simple fact that everybody calls him Pop, it's weird. I mean, you can't say Pop every day of your working life and not have it settle in with some meaning. I mean, he was really consistently called a father figure by many players. Pop, he's been like a father figure to me. I feel like a daddy you know, to all these guys. But back to Timmy. Just like in any successful cult, you can't just have the man at the top. You need disciples on the ground showing the new members the way and how to behave. I know there's a name for that, but whatever. But Tim Duncan was essentially the Tom Cruise of the pop cult because Tom Cruise was the ambassador and face of Scientology. He was promoted and relied on to make the broader system work. And maybe most importantly, Tom was constantly praising and elevating the leader of the Scientologists, David Meskaldrich. 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 That I, I have never met a more competent, a more intelligent, a more tolerant, a more compassionate being. And I've met the leaders of leaders. Okay? I've met them all. So I say to you, Sir COB, we are lucky to have you and thank you very much. And even the folks who didn't know him all that well, the respect they had for Tom was easily transferred onto David. Tim Duncan was that. And as a side note, if you look into Tim's rumored personal life, much like Tony, he's a deviant too. And it has nothing to do with the potential that he was gay. It's this idea that he had a live-in boyfriend at home with his wife. I mean, to each his own, but this ain't a typical arrangement. So going to work, Playing theoretical sub-dom grab-ass with daddy may not have been a total stretch. Let's move on to the elephant in the arena. Kawhi. The outer shell screaming dumb little submissive, clueless and naive and in need of instruction. What? He clearly saw Popovich as a figure in control and wise and, you know, maybe he was. But we need to start judging Pop in the post-Duncan era more realistically. How many times have you heard this? Pop would go after everyone. And sometimes he'd even get in Duncan's face, which signaled to the rest of the team that everyone could get it, and everyone's equal here. That is pure manipulation. This method of yelling at your superstar in public was the way to make everyone accept the yelling and abuse. He'll still scream at me, but, but he's different now. Because if Pop would reprimand the star, well, he could reprimand anyone. But that's why I love Greg Popovich. There are no favorites on his team. It doesn't matter if it's Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, or Kawhi Leonard. He's going to give you exactly what he's feeling. If Timmy didn't complain or take it personal, look what I was trying to do yesterday. You're being stubborn. Then they absolutely couldn't either. Other people behind you like, oh, he's getting on Tim. Well, I better fall in line behind him. This anecdote has been told over and over and is one of the keys to Pop creating his own reality. But he is getting into his star player, Kawhi Leonard, scratching his chin. I'll tell you what, folks, he'll get the message. That's just the way it goes in San Antonio. But people clearly knew Pop wants everybody below him, accountable to him, and eager for his instruction. And the other thing that's also clear is he does not like stars. Because when he gets his hand on one, he burns them, cuts them off, kills their potential, lowers their ceiling. 
And again, that's why he has that obsession with drafting and finding D-leaguers and foreigners with the gratefulness and appreciation that is innately doing the work for him. These guys come in praising Pop. So when Kawhi started to question the system in Pop and his infinite wisdom, we saw the system do what cults do. It started trying to purge the dissenter, tried to eliminate it on many fronts. The person who dared to question the system. And all Kawhi did was initially ask for a second opinion on his injury, but it devolved from there. What do you do if you're the star player and your organization, you do not trust its doctors? Then yesterday, the Spurs decided to announce to us that the team doctors have cleared him, which puts Kawhi Leonard in the position of fighting the organization on what he believes to be his body and his health. Seriously, you would expect, like with Kobe or MJ, in many other instances, when a star gets a little uncomfortable and acts different, especially when there's a fissure with management, what usually happens is that the organization will bend over backwards to accommodate the star. When Jerry Krause said that organizations win championship, not just players, that offended MJ. He never really resolved that, but the organization, Phil Jackson specifically, stayed on MJ's side and accommodated him. When Kobe demanded a trade after a couple bad post shaq years, the organization did what they could and got him some help. Even Cleveland. Cleveland tried to do this time after time, giving into basically anything LeBron wanted. And even with the owner and player having irreconcilable differences, which was completely understandable, because who the hell writes this kind of letter about a guy, they still did what LeBron wanted. The Spurs, it seemed like they could have easily supported Kawhi and stood by him. But after we talking non-professional playing folks on TV hyped Kawhi up to the top tier of the NBA talent, and the doubt seeped into his mind about whose best interest the team really had, you would expect that's the time for the team to make nice with their franchise player. But no, they behave in a complete ass backwards way and not only begun to paint their own narrative of an ego-filled diva, they also sent out the disciples to defame him even more, taking on the idea that he's soft, that he's a bitch. It's out there, we, he's with us, but um... You know, it's hard when you don't practice with the team. The, the, the bulk of the camaraderie and is pre-game, post-game, and half-time, so when you're going through adversity or some travel, and he's, he's not with us most of the time. I've been through it. It was a rehab for me too for eight months, you know, so uh, same kind of injury. Uh, my mind was a hundred times worse, but the same kind of injury, and uh, just try to stay positive. I trust my Spurs doctors. They've been with me, you know, my whole career. They know my body better than anybody. And so for me, it was a no-brainer to do the surgery with them. So when I did my injury, 48 hours, I was in surgery. I didn't take like two weeks and go uh, through option. Pop was not going to be bested. This was the most cultish thing possible, publicly discrediting Kawhi. This is literally what the Church of Scientology does. Tony and Manu were clearly instructed, or inherently through their training, they knew it was time to turn on Kawhi and purge. Anything that comes out in the media, or anything that needs to be said, uh, distributed, said to or distributed down to the team, right. it comes from Pop through Tony and Ginobili. Now, y'all might not believe this. What the fuck? This is really unprecedented. We begin with Kawhi Leonard apparently souring on the San Antonio Spurs. And the media, fully committed to Pop's reality, and putting aside the fact that he's the 70-year-old man dealing with a 20-something in turmoil. They put the burden of reasonability on Kawhi. They say, why would he question the Spurs doctors? They're the best. Why would he not play if he was cleared to play? Why would he do this to his teammates? Why would he do this to Pop? This seems to be irresponsibly dumb. Yeah, I think so To too. me. On, on, from the outside looking in. there at your organization. The, you're the face of the most stable franchise in the NBA over the last 15 years. What the hell are you doing? This is not how normal forward moving franchises operate. You know a situation where a kid gets kidnapped and held in the basement for 20 years and at some point they just accept their reality? That's when the kidnapper likes to demonstrate their power. See, the ultimate power play of cults
chained up in a basement eating out of a dog bowl for some reason stays with this, stays with their master, and doesn't just instinctively bolt. There's a force or restraint that is put on the kid that is placed so deep in their brain that they cannot get loose. And then in the worst cases, and hang with me here, this is not a direct comparison to Kawhi, I'm just demonstrating what control really can be. In some cases, the kidnapper will impregnate a victim and force them to give birth to a child. Just think about that child. That child will be even more attached to this world, having no clue there's a natural freedom bestowed to all of us outside of this basement. This is just the level of control a person can have. It's not just physical, the handcuffs, it's the mental control, having the victim truly believe there is no other way. So that's where we're gonna jump back to basketball. There are no handcuffs, but there's contracts, and that's the conventional prison bars. But with Pop, he goes further and installs the mental restraints, and he exhibits his fetishy behavior of presenting freedom, his version of walking his prisoner out in public. And the way he does it is by first, not allowing his players to become marketable or brand faces. Somehow he blocks them from exercising their full potential. But then, what he does is allow them to do one advertisement, one spot every year. And he gets them all involved in these local supermarket ads, giving them the facade of exposure, but ultimately not really. Have you seen these? It smells great, fellas. What's cooking? H-E-B specialty burgers. You have the brisket burger, the blue cheese burger. Don't forget the salmon burger. Sounds great. Can I have some? Sure. So we should, I don't know, share? No, we would need to... Uh, cook more? Come on, man. You know what we want. <sighs> Toss another burger on the barbie. Yes! <laughs> I love his accent, man. Why would you toss a burger at a barbie? These guys are not doing advertisement. Maybe they're not allowed to do advertisements for a lot of companies. It's a snowball. And then they show up in these local-ass spots. All of them. This is control. I mean, I get it. He's not literally blocking them from big ad campaigns as they've popped up here and there. But what he has relied on are those mental handcuffs and having an environment where doing outside stuff is super duper frowned upon and it's a distraction and I don't know, not a team first type move. In strengthening his blockade, you have your main guy virtually absent from the big brand game. It creates a wall, a subconscious line you must cross if you want that world. It's Pop's line in the sand that nobody really questions, mainly because they're all so damn thankful and humble. Side note. Look at uh, LaMarcus over here. Not sure a regional supermarket ad is what he originally thought of when he left Portland to become a uh, star. <laughs> Another sign of cult behavior was how this Kawhi situation ended. The image of Pop is benevolent and smart and fatherly. But what father ends a relationship with spite and vengeance? What father figure turns on a decade-long relationship with the son in an effort to bury and banish him? And it was personal. Through the media, we learned that Kawhi's dream destination was LA. And given that the NBA is primarily a business drenched in competition, understandably, he couldn't just send his best player to a rival in the same conference. But at the same time, you don't have to find the literal, complete opposite in every way and send him there either. You don't have to literally send him to another country in the cold. A team that, other than the Spurs, probably gets the least publicity. Their ratings don't even count. And it's not even by their choice. Even with the winning and the attempt at branding, we the North, and Drake, the Raptors as a top tier NBA brand just has not stuck. There is not a wave of young fans jumping on the Raptors bandwagon. Not a lot of Lowry jerseys bouncing around the streets of Missouri. The Spurs, Pop deliberately sent him there as a fuck you. Again, to keep his system in place, he has to spot the dissonance before it develops. And that's the young, talented players who don't immediately fall in line, or they show too much character, off and on the court. But it's beyond the team. Greg Popovich has a need to dominate every interaction. And over time, he forcibly sets the tone for every relationship. From being an outright dick to this dying man and every other sideline reporter. Are there some questions here you can ask me, or what are we gonna do? being such a dick to the point where it seemed endearing, I guess, to the post games, where embarrassing a reporter is a sport of its own. What went wrong for you guys tonight? Uh, what went wrong for us? Come on, you're getting paid. Ask something. Isn't he supposed to be a measured genius? He's more of an asshole than anything. I still don't get why we give him a pass. I don't think a lot of other coaches could get away with this, and I know for a fact players can't. When players pull this shit, they get crucified.
dominate the relationship, making the league submit to his will. It is sick. Another thing, when you are with the Spurs, you will never get top building well, we for so anything. You, guys are gonna you do up not get to be outspoken. Bit, right? You can't talk to those guys 24 hours a day, Tony. But you know who does? You know who gets to be a larger than life character? The one who gets to be a bright spot, a beacon, a voice? Pop. You know, I don't, I don't think about some platform that I have. I'm an individual. Uh, I live in this country. I have a right to say and think what I want. It's got nothing to do with, you know, my position. If it helps somebody else think one way or the other about something, great. But the discussion has to take place. Political statements and all. We love Pop's take on the world. Some folks even tossed out... Pop for president. We listen to Pop. But as we listen to Pop preach, he simultaneously is silencing his own players. And on his military background, what is the military approach? That everyone basically is the same. And the next man up approach, it's in full effect. And that it's not about the individual, it's about the mission. But you know something about the military? It is all about the mission and not the person until you get to the top, where there's a great push for recognition and praise and glamor when you're a four-star general, three-star, two-star, or whatever you're in charge, that should with two G's. The biggest thing is, you know, with Kawhi, this is the first time that Pop has a superstar that he can't control. Yeah. This is the first time that the superstar doesn't march to his beat. Uh, he's always had a great relationship with Tim, Tony, and Ginobili. I think this is where it stops. And people wonder why it's so messy, why their meeting in San Diego that was billed as the last chance to reconcile was only Obligatory all this forgiven hug with Pop and move on. And shake his hand or do the obligatory hug and get that out of the way for all to see and move on with your basketball life. Yep, that's exactly what I just said. Well, guess what? You don't go to the jail and hug your kidnapper. You don't embrace an abuser just for the optics. After you finally get away, you stay away. Kawhi is a young man, first time away from his cult. He needs time and distance. I mean, their meeting was 10 minutes long. That's not on Kawhi. Kawhi's in his 20s. Pop is in his 70s. And he's the father figure. This is on Pop to mend this wound, even for the ability to move on. But as we cover today, this is not his goal. His goal is to dominate and control and make people submit. And if you don't, he will treat you like shit and cast you off. And the 10 minute meeting is a demonstration of that. The meeting that Pop and Kawhi had in San Diego, the one time they sort of spoke and saw in person since Kawhi left, had left the team for good, lasted 10 minutes. So that is how everyone in the organization knew that did not go well. Just because Kawhi ascended to the top of the league and gained a new perspective, where he started seeing himself on the same level as KD and LeBron, and wondering why his trajectory didn't include the perks and fanfare that theirs did. A top five player who couldn't even get a max shoe deal. And don't let anybody tell you it's because he's quiet. Are you kidding me? That's an entire angle Nike or whoever could play up and build an entire campaign about. The tagline could be, don't talk about it, be about it, or some mess like that. The quiet storm, I don't know. The problem is that he was under the Spurs' thumb and everybody knows there is zero flourishing under Pop. There's a long receiving line to kiss Pop's butt. And oh my God, he, he can't stand Donald Trump. He's the greatest thing in the world. Well, here he is being a bully. And, and, and to me, messing with a guy's money Kawhi Leonard, whose future's on the line, I think Pop's being unfair. Kawhi, a young man who put in the work, he's the reason he became what he is. But everybody was and has tied Pop's name to his success. 
he would forever be known as a pop creation, or something that pop found and nurtured. And for such a quiet, unabrasive player to get to this place in the NBA, people thought he needed this perfect organization to fit his personality. That it was because of the Spurs and the Spurs system that he became who he is. And that such a meek person can become such a player. But this is false. What we understand as Kawhi isn't his personality. At least not forever. It doesn't have to be. And see, in San Antonio, they are used to guys just doing whatever they want you to do. Tim Duncan, David Robinson, Parker, you know, that's how they work. Kawhi, even though he's quiet, very quiet, he Don't is take exactly, he's kind. his own man. All this narrative reliance on the Spurs and Pop specifically, that's got to get annoying after a bit. At some point, being a grown-ass man, you want to step out of daddy's shadow. I feel like a daddy, you know, to all these guys. And make your bones as Kawhi and not just Pop's creation. He should have room to develop and explore, to break out of this dumb, clueless persona that they perpetuate, even in those dumb commercials they do. Why would you toss a burger at a Barbie? I mean, I cannot overstate how crucial and obvious these HEB commercials are, this method. It's a snowball. People believe TV, and we know that to the highest degree. So what happens is it turns into another blindside narrative. You know, poor, uneducated black kid who, without the generosity of some white savior, would not have made it. So now he has a chance, kind of. But don't make him go back. Don't put that pressure on him to mend this relationship with this elderly man who can't even be kind enough to answer a couple questions after a game. You're serious? Yeah, I'm serious. We should not be shaming Kawhi into going to Pop's Team USA mini cult, mini camp. That's just sick. That is not on him. It is truly weird how a sign of greatness is having players come to your organization and completely conform, losing their personality or edge and fading away into submission. We say it's all about the team, but it's all about the team until the career is over. And then you're on your own. But that's Pop. And you can appreciate him all you want. But I believe we should know what he really is. Pop is the center of the system and somehow gets credit for being selfless and kind and generous and genius. But what he really is, he's a megalomaniac, a monster. He's obsessed with control, a man with a god complex. He's full of anger, resentment, and vengeance. And clearly has zero regard for any of his players. Unless... They do exactly what he tells them and fully submits. See, I don't think Kawhi was on the outs with Pop. I think he got too close. I think he got so close that he actually got to see who he really was. And just like Manson said, And a straight razor if you get too close to me. So here's a couple of interesting things. I can't wait to see what happens when Kawhi comes back to the Alamo Dome, or whatever it's called, for his first game against the Spurs. I can't wait to see that interaction. And two, let's watch DeMar DeRozan get along with his cult. Let's see if Pop tries to break him, or if he immediately submits. I mean, the past few years, the NBA has tried to serve DeMar up as a star. And he does have the numbers to match, but after the Pop initiation and conditioning, indoctrination. Let's see if he fits in or fades away. All right. As always, remember Minute, everything evergreen.